acknowledge that we are in the lands of a nation of egg nation. This spot where we gather are the traditional lands of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Ottawa, Potawatomi, and Ojibwe. We also recognize that this land is now home to the Delaware Nation. This land was settled through the McKee Purchase Treaty of 1790, and we as beneficiaries of the treaty must recognize our responsibilities, including our collective responsibilities to the land and water. Mr. Mayor, we do not have a supplementary agenda this evening, and I have not heard of any pecuniary interest, direct or indirect, for the open session agenda items. We have something very unique in front of us tonight. It is called Mark's Yarn Ball, and I'm going to hand it over to Amy Wilcox for the introduction. Mayor and, Mayor and Council, it is, my, it is my, pleasure my pleasure to be here today. As many of you know, for the past few months, the Mayor has been working to find ways to increase and enhance public art in our community. As part of celebrating CK in May, and to help celebrate the reawakening of arts and culture in Chatham-Kent, what better way to kick off the celebration than to bring public art to Council Chambers? Public art not only adds a unique visual element to a room, but can also inspire creativity and stimulate conversation and collaboration in a meeting space. We wish to thank Mark Reinhardt, a local artist who has been creating beautiful works of art for many years and has won numerous awards and accolades for this work and who has agreed to work with us on this art project. We are honored to have Mark with us here today to bring Yarn Ball a stunning piece of interactive art that will serve as a testament to the vibrancy and creativity of our community. This piece was started in 2012, and many of you in this room may have contributed to this piece of art in the past. Yarn Ball represents many years of collaboration between residents and community groups throughout our community. It is an intersection of thoughts, hopes, and dreams for the community. Yarn Ball will be in council chambers for several weeks, and will evolve over time. Without further ado, I'd like to invite Mark Reinhardt to share a few words. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council, for having me and my friend, the Yarn Ball, here today. Um, as Amy suggested, this is a project many years in the making. Um, and as is the case with um, art and public art in general, um, it's open to interpretation. So I've prepared um, a presentation that I'd like to share with you uh, this evening and, and how the yarn ball has come to be and a little bit about where I come from as well. But I am curious for your thoughts um, and interpretations and for you all to jump in the yarn ball like many of, you, many of you already have before the meeting tonight. So without further ado. I think we make acknowledgments to mine for space for new truths, to stand and walk with traces and histories, to mark a resonance of understanding of belonging and representation, to tip a hat and to curtsy to a way of being and to momentums that began long before us. And I think we acknowledge the land because it is the ground from which we all rise, from which our physical and social architectures are built up and torn down as a practice, trying on futures like we try on clothes, their drag revealing their impermanence and the possibilities of their performance. From what else do we rise? What else serves as the ground from which we become little beings wandering and wondering in this great universe. For me, I rise from my mom, who talked to trees, who chased challenging conversations, and who I now talk to when I go to Lake Huron and sit with the water. I extend from her long conversations, her earth-covered hands, and her humble curiosity for the way things are and sometimes pretend to be. She was a warrior for compassion and chased common ground. Together, we built closets in which to store our futures 
and to move in and out of as we endeavored toward intersecting rhythms and new ways of seeing the world. From her gaze, I began this yarn ball along the waters of Mud Creek. Each time the yarn is wound around a tree, whether produced by my own hands or the work of many, it then finds its way into this ball. What began as an experimental performance, a practice of creating new worlds through which to move, has turned into an exercise in documentation. Its intentions have been a humble one toward an idea of how to represent collaboration, how to reveal the nuances of collectivity and of coming together. Each colorful thread, a record of a perspective and a reflection on a different way of being in the world. Its power derived from that collectively determined history. Its installation here, a moment of equity and acupuncture. Its mobility teases an echo of an essentially elusive structure, and in that elusiveness, we can find potential, momentum, and change. From this yarn ball, from the voices it animates and archives, from the space it activates in this horseshoe, from this land, from my mom. I aim to find ways to connect to the wind, to sail on new rhythms, to move with and to dance with, and to chase the creation of spaces and stages from which a proposition for a kaleidoscopic way of being connected sets off into the air. Stars in conversation, connected by color and compassion, like fireworks illuminating our night skies. Okay, Council, we have a presentation. We have a presentation by Gord Prentice. Um, his name is Lieutenant Colonel Gord Prentice. He is the commanding officer of the Essex and Kent Scottish Regiment. He was raised in Chatham. He belonged to the Army Cadets, 59 Army Cadet Corps, joined regular forces, been deployed on numerous UN peacekeeping missions, awarded the Medal of Bravery for his heroic actions in Cyprus, and currently resides with his wife and family in London. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, councillors. Thank you for uh, allowing me the opportunity to speak to you this evening. I'd like to start off by saying that uh, I, I greatly, and the regiment greatly appreciates the support that's been shown by this council and indeed Chatham Kent generally towards the military and in particular the S. Kent Scottish. Um, it's, it's quite uh, remarkable the level of community engagement and support that we see uh, when we're out doing our thing in, in uniform, and it is very much appreciated. Um, that said, I'll get on to why I'm here tonight, which is to talk about uh, something we're doing this coming weekend, uh, which is a major ceremonial event for us and involves a royal visit and will involve both of our garrisons in Windsor and Chatham. So in Chatham in particular, it's the layup of old colours and the exercise of the freedom of, city, of the city of Chatham, Kent. So why is this important? So I'll just talk a little bit about colours and I'll show you a picture of colours in a few minutes if you don't know what they are. But colours really represent the lifeblood of the regiment and it's written in blood. I mean, it's our history written in blood, and that might sound kind of macabre, um, but that really is, is the fact of it. And when you see the, the photo of the colors, you're gonna recognize some of the names on there, some of the major battles that have been fought uh, by members of, of the, the regiment, the Essex Scottish or the Kent Regiment, or even going further back into history. Um, and, and it really is a, a near and dear thing held to the regiment. They're consecrated. They never go anywhere except under armed guard. They are the regiment's most prized possession. Hundreds of Chatham, Kent, and Windsor-esque citizens have, have died in war, unfortunately. That is reality. Um, certainly as recently as World War II, you know, the Kent Regiment didn't deploy overseas, but a lot of individuals from Kent County and from Chatham deployed as part of the Essex Scottish and did in fact go overseas and, and pay the ultimate uh, price. Um, sadly, we hold, a, we hold because of our affiliation or our history through the Essex Scottish the dubious honour of having suffered the highest casualty rate uh, at, at that rather ill-fated rate in Dieppe, something in the range of 80 to 85 percent casualties. So um, certainly colors are very important to us and those names that are emblazoned on the colors aren't just names, they've got great meaning. 
So that's a photograph of the colors as they're typically displayed, crossed like that. Um, that's the sovereign's color, or what's now referred to as the king's color on the left, looks very much like the national flag with the regimental crest in the middle. Infantry regiments pretty much all have a set of colors, I think they all do, and, and it'll look pretty much like that other than the, the regiment's name. The color on the right is the regimental color. That one is unique to each regiment. It bears specific devices uh, that are particular to that specific regiment. The colors may be different. Um, the, the regimental name, of course, is different. And then the battle honors, which are emblazoned on it, some of them overlap with other regiments because, of course, it's not just one regiment in a battle. Um, but certainly, uh, it is a unique thing to, to our regiment. So that's what the old color looks like right now. The battle honors that are emblazoned on there, they run in chronological order from top to bottom. So looking on each side, top to bottom, you've got five each from the First World War, followed by five each from the Second World War. That's about half of the color of the battle honors that we hold. We actually hold 41 battle honors. So colors wear out after a period of time because they do get used, they get taken out, they get paraded, and eventually the stitching starts to fade, the material, or fail, the material starts to fade, uh, and we need to be reissued a new set of colors. And that's what we're doing next weekend is we're getting a new set of colors. So the last set was issued to us in, in 1994, so these are relatively young. It's about as early as you would expect to see a set of colors replaced, but we're, starting, we're taking the opportunity as well uh, to have some new battle honors emblazoned. We were recently awarded uh, additional battle honors for the War of 1812, as well as for Afghanistan. So Afghanistan really is kind of near and dear to a lot of us because it's in the modern era, and we in fact have a lot of members serving in the regiment today who have participated in the Afghan campaign. Uh, colors are always presented by a, a person of significance. It is ideally a member of the royal family. It can be a vice regal appointment, lieutenant governor, uh, the Governor General. Um, typically the way it works is the Governor General has the right of first refusal as Commander-in-Chief of the Canadian Armed Forces, and in our case she has deferred uh, to allow our Colonel-in-Chief, Prince Michael of Kent, uh, the Queen's first cousin, uh, to actually come and present the colours on her behalf. Prince Michael holds the appointment within our regiment of Colonel-in-Chief. Uh, other regiments have a royal as, as Colonel-in-Chief. Uh, Her Majesty the Queen was uh, Colonel-in-Chief for the Argonne Southern Long Highlanders in Hamilton. Uh, the Princess Royal will be coming to uh, New Brunswick in a few days' time uh, for the 175th anniversary of the 8th Canadian Hussars. So those kinds of connections with, with royalty are very, uh, very deep amongst the regiments. And of course, Prince Michael has confirmed his attendance and will be presenting. So sort of an overview of activities for the weekend. So the 13th of May, the focus is on Windsor, the retirement of the old colours, and the presentation of the new colours. So that'll be a very formal, intricate parade on the waterfront in Windsor. And then we shift over to, uh, to a dinner that evening. So the old colors will be paraded for their final time. They'll be trooped and marched off parade, never to be paraded again as part of the regiment. And then we'll, we will be presented on that same parade with our new colors by Prince Michael. Sunday is where the emphasis shifts to Chatham. Everyone comes to Chatham, including His Royal Highness. And we're into the layup of old colors at Christ Church the exercise of the freedom of the city, and a reception of the Chatham Armouries. So in terms of the layup, colors, when they're retired, because they are consecrated, and as I've indicated, they're very near and dear to our hearts. We don't just throw them in the garbage or put them in a drawer or you know, file them away. They're laid up in a very specific location. Historically, that's always been a church. The direction these days is that it needs to be someplace of easy access to the public where they can come and appreciate the military history and that sort of thing. But in our case, the decision's been made that Christ Church, because of its long history with the Kent Regiment and now the S. Kent Scottish, is where these colors will be laid up. So there will be a church service on Sunday the 14th at Christ Church Anglican. And at the end of that service, those colors will be brought up to the front, placed on the altar, um, blessed and, and laid up formally, and they'll never leave there again. They're going to be framed and mounted on the wall uh, with colors from the Kent Regiment. There are three sets of colors from the Kent Regiment that are there now, so these will join them on the wall. Once that's out of the way, after lunch, we're going to do the freedom of the city. We're actually going to exercise the freedom of the city. It's been previously granted back, I think, in 1985. The S. Kent Scottish were granted the freedom of the city of Chatham. So now we're going to exercise that freedom, and I believe this is the first time it's been exercised since it was granted. 
So when we're finished at Christ Church, we're going to form up. We're going to have bayonets fixed. We're going to have the new colors flying. And we're going to march down the street. And we're going to come to City Hall. When we arrive at City Hall, there's a bit of medieval formality that goes on where the chief constable, the chief of police, is going to halt the regiment at the, at the non-existent city walls. But that's the way it's supposed to, to represent. So he's going to halt us at the gate, so to speak, ask who goes there. I'm going to come forward. He'll bring me up to City Hall. We do a ceremonial knock on the door are greeted by mayor and council. There are some, some words and presentations of various things that happen. And then the regiment will, will march off through the city. We're going to proceed down King Street to the cenotaph, lay a wreath at the cenotaph, and then on to the old armory, because that, again, has great historical significance to us. So we've made arrangements to use the old armory, uh, where we'll have a, uh, a post-Freedom of the City reception. And then Prince Michael will depart back to the UK. And, and that is it, basically, for the weekend. So in terms of the parade route, just to give you an idea of that, you can see Christ Church at the bottom right. So we're going to move up along Wellington, straight across Wellington to King, do a right turn onto King, which brings us in front of City Hall, where the chief police will halt us. We'll run through the formalities there. Uh, there'll be a few speeches, myself, the mayor, and I believe uh, Prince Michael as well. Once those formalities are, are finished, as I've said, we'll, we'll step off again, march down with the, the pipes and drums leading down King Street, brief halt at the Cenotaph, and then into the old armories for the reception. So the reception itself um, is intended really for the, the, the regimental family, so to speak, and, and a few selected individuals that have been invited. Um, what we would like to see and we encourage is participation by the public in the freedom of the city ceremony. We're, we're limited in terms of capacities at, at Christ Church and, and uh, the reception, as you can imagine, but certainly the, the freedom of the city is something that's obviously done very much in the public eye, and we certainly encourage the people of Chatham Kent to come out and see their regiment uh, parade down the main street of Chatham. Pending your questions, that concludes my presentation. Gord, I think you very much explained it, and uh, a very good job. I, I know I'm personally very much looking forward to it, uh, to celebrate what the military has done for this great country of ours for so many years, and th th that's the reason Canada is Canada, because of our military. So thank you very much, and looking forward to Sunday. Council, moving on to consent agenda. Uh, this evening we have five items that, or sorry, three items that have been pulled. Item 15A, which is a presentation by Chief uh, Gary Kahn from the Chatham-Kent Police Services. Item 16A, Tender Award Contract T23-191, Dufferin Ave Road of Rehabilitation, has been pulled by Councillor Hall and Councillor C. McGregor. And item 17B, the Councillor Award Funding Program update, has been pulled by Councillor Thompson and Councillor Sakachi. Therefore, left on the consent agenda to be approved in one motion are items 14A, 16B, C, D, E, F, 17A, C, D, item 18A, 19A, 20A, 21AB, and 22A. Councillor McGrail and Councillor Thompson, can we should move the consent agenda, please? Sure, I'll move that. And I'll second it. Seeing no questions, we'll put it to vote. Councillor Pinsnow, how would you like to vote? Yes. And Councillor Story? Yes. Thank you. All votes are in. Motion passes 17 to 0. We'll go to item 15, police services. Uh, this evening we have a presentation by Chief Gary Kahn. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Just bear with me one moment. Yeah, great. Super, thank you. So I've been given my marching orders earlier today to keep it from our municipal clerk, uh, keep it to 10 minutes. So please bear with me. I will uh, go through this presentation rather quickly. Usually this orientation training I, I conduct 
in camera, and I usually allot, you know, anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, a lot of that has to do with Q and A's afterwards, um, but hopefully we won't have many. I'll try to be as informative as possible as I go through this presentation. So tonight, what I'm going to provide council with is orientation surrounding the Police Services Board, and specifically, what is the Police Services Board's responsibilities? So, our Police Service Board consists of five members, and we are governed uh, by a civilian authority derived from the Ontario Police Services Act, and that is the governing, governing legislation for police services in Ontario. That act is about to change. Um, it is going to, it's already received royal assent, it's been proclaimed. We're hoping it will come into force probably second quarter of 2024. I preface what I'm about to say with the fact that I do not want to speak on behalf of the provincial government, but that is what we've been told as police services, that they're still working on the, uh, at the technical tables in regards to the regs. The regulations is really the meat and potatoes for the act, for us anyway, as police services. Um, so we're once again hoping that that will come into effect by the second quarter of 2024. There are five members appointed to our board. And really, again, the size of the board is dependent upon the size of your municipality. If you have a municipality which is less than 25,000 citizens, you can have a board of three members. If your municipality exceeds 25,000 people, then it will be a five-member board, as long as it does not exceed 300,000 people. If your municipality has more than 300,000 people, then you will have a seven-member board. Uh, the five board members consist of one, the mayor, uh, and, and one municipal councillor, councillor crew, uh, two appointees from the province, and one appointee from council representing the community. And I will go there. We have a picture there. Uh, now, that's from last year. We've got to get a more current picture because the one provincial representative there, Mr. Don Foucault, is no longer a member of our police services board, but everyone here knows the person who replaced uh, Mr. Don Foucault, and that's former councillor Doug Smallman. Um, so as you can see, our chair is Mr. Pat Weaver. He's the appo municipal appointee at large. Uh, Ms. Darlene Smith is vice chair. She's a provincial appointee. Uh, mayor and councillor crew are our two um, representatives from municipal councillor, your representatives. And then obviously Mr. Doug Solomon is our pro provincial uh, appointee, and then Mrs. Carol Halling is our board uh, secretary, executive assistant. So what are the responsibilities of the board? I'll go through these really quickly. Uh, there are about 12 of them. Um, they're pretty self-explanatory, but I can provide some further information if you have any questions. So the board is basically responsible for a bunch of things. It provides civilian oversight. It provides governance. And the number one thing, or certainly in the top three anyways, is it ensures that the police service is providing adequate and effective policing to the citizens of our municipality. It also conducts a strategic plan business plan, the direction of the police service for the next four years. I present it, but they work in collaboration with our senior administration in developing a strategic plan once every four years. Currently it's three years, but in the new act, it's gonna be once every four years. So as you can see there, prov provision of adequate and effective policing services in municipality and shall appoint the members of the municipal police force. A lot of people think I do the hiring and termination of members, I do not. I oversee the process, the system, our hiring process. Um, I'll also do discipline in respect to it. But at the end of the day, I have to go for the board with a board report, and they ultimately decide if the person is going to be hired or if the person is going to be uh, terminated. Uh, they generally determine after consultation with the chief objectives, priorities with respect to police services in the municipality. I've already touched on that. That's our strategic plan. Uh, they establish policies for the effective management of the police force. Now, bear in mind, there is a difference between policies. That's why we refer to board policies versus operational procedures. The procedures, we amend, we edit, edit on, a, well, on a daily, annual basis. Uh, but 
Policies are board policies. They are their policies. Uh, recruit and appoint the chief of police and any deputy chief of police and annually determine their remuneration and working conditions taking their submissions into account. We do that every year. I have to do my performance appraisal. I sit down with the uh, police services board and go through my performance appraisal and in turn I do the deputy chief's performance appraisal. But I do present that to the board. Uh, they can direct the chief of police and monitor his or her performance. Again, on an annual basis when they do my performance appraisal, my performance appraisal is based on competencies. It's also based upon key performance indicators, objectives, all of that sort of um, granular detail that we have to provide. And uh, again, on an annual basis, I, I provide that to the board. Uh, established policies respect, respecting the disclosure by chiefs of police of personal information about individuals. That's specifically in regards to FIPA, that's governed by FIPA or MFIPA, Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. But there are exceptions under the Police Services Act where if public safety, I feel, is in, in jeopardy, then there are instances where I can um, disclose public information to to our municipality, to, to the general public. Uh, going on with G, receive regular reports from the Chief of Police on disclosures and decisions made under Section 49. Section 49 is secondary activities, um, so secondary work. Um, obviously, a memo comes before me before that. In a lot of cases, I will approve, but there are instances where I will not approve secondary activities where it may be a, a conflict of interest. For example, if a police officer wants to become a Brinks um, armored um, personnel or wants to do VIP security as a bodyguard or uh, be a bodyguard at a, or sorry, a bouncer at a bar, obviously those are going to run into conflict of interest in respect to our, our profession and those are obviously denied. H, established guidelines with respect to the indemnification of members of the police force for legal costs under Section 50. Section 50 basically deals with liability for torts. What I'm talking about there is they will absorb, the board will absorb the costs associated to, um, I should preface that with legal reasonable costs. Um, if there is an, a defense of a civil action or a criminal prosecution, um, in both those cases, only if the, they will not incur the cost if the member is found guilty. So they will incur the cost and that's all covered under indemnification in section 50 of the Police Services Act. Established guidelines for dealing with complaints under part five. Every year in our annual reports, I provide a outline of those public complaints that we have received on an annual basis. The public can complain about three things when it comes to a police service can complain about the conduct of a police officer, can complain about the service or lack thereof of a service provided to the individual, or it can complain about our policies or our procedures. Vast majority of the complaints are in regards to conduct. Review the Chief of Police's administration of the complaint system under Part 5 and receive regular reports. I've already touched on that. That is done on an annual basis um, in our annual reports. And number two, the board may give orders and directions to the chief of police, but not to other members of the police force. And no individual member of the board shall give orders or directions to any member of the police force. Obviously, one individual, it has to be collective. If the board wishes or wants to direct me in respect to uh, an administration, an infrastructure, a policy, a procedure, it has to be collectively agreed upon. So for example, Councilor Crew cannot phone me up later on and say, no, I want you to do this individually. It has to be the board's decision collectively. Uh, in respect to the chief, the only ones that they can direct is the chief, and that's obviously not to undermine the authority of the chief, so they can't circumvent me and go to one of my inspectors or to my deputy chief. The only one that they could direct is the chief. Uh, number three, the board shall not direct the chief of police with respect to specific operational decisions, nor do I believe that they ever would want to. I've never had one that ever wanted to 
uh, direct us in our day-to-day -day operations. Um, only with respect to administrative functions, goals, objectives, budget, strategic planning, policies, uh, policies, all of the aforementioned that I've already discussed. Uh, this further includes discipline of police service or its officers. So the Police Services Board is also governed. It's governed by OCPC. OCPC is the Ontario Civilian Police Commission and they can discipline boards if they act outside of their jurisdiction or authority or misconduct of a board member as well, much like police officers. Board members are subject to code of conduct under the PSA, refrain from any conduct that would discredit or compromise board or police service or bring, bring disrepute to the reputation of our service. The board is not governed by municipal council. I think everybody here is, is aware of that. And the board determines, and I've already talked about this, adequate and effective level of service in the police budget and can appeal to OCPC if municipal council impacts adequacy, adequacy or effectiveness of policing in a community. And I think I've already touched on that when I presented our budget for 2023. So what entails adequate and effective policing? There are five core functions which make up adequate and effective policing. They are on the slide in front of you. They revolve around crime prevention. Again, these are pretty much self-explanatory. Crime prevention, law enforcement, law enforcement, the actual arresting and laying of charges of individuals, victim assistance. We are mandated under the, uh, under the uh, Police Services Act to provide assistance to victims of crime. Public order maintenance. Um, when I'm talking about public order maintenance, we are mandated, police services are mandated to have units for labor disputes, unlawful picketing, things of that nature. And then finally, emergency response. And when I'm talking about emergency response, I'm talking about tactical units, hostage, um, hostage rescue teams, crisis negotiators, critical incident commanders, and explosive, explosive disposal technicians and all of those we have. Adequacy standards, remember what I was talking about at the technical tables, producing the adequacy, the standards um, in regards to the Police Services Act. These are some of, the, some of those topics that fall under the standards of adequacy under the Police Services Act. Again, I'm not going to read them all. They're pretty self-explanatory. The, the only thing that I would um, provide some explanation to is under forensics. So the second column to the right, the far right, you'll see abbreviations for ICE, DFU, and AFU. ICE stands for Internet Child Exploitation Unit. DFU is Digital Forensics Unit. And AFU is our Assets Forfeiture Unit. Transparency and Accountability. You'll often hear police officers talk about the pillars of our profession, and really the pillars of our profession surround public trust and um, public trust and community confidence, professionalism, uh, public image and perception, as well as those, those two up at the top there, transparency and accountability. Those are truly the pillars of our profession. And there's probably no other occupation that has more civilian oversight and governance than our profession, policing, and rightfully so. We have extraordinary powers of arrest, search and seizure, that dictates and warrants that civilian oversight and governance. And these are some of the entities which provide that for, our, for all police services in Ontario. You've got OIPRD, which deals with public complaints, Ontario Independent Police Review Directorate. You've got OCPC, I already talked about that, and how they regulate uh, police Services Boards, Ontario Civilian Police Commission. We've got Special Investigations Unit. If there is any interaction with the police and the public and that uh, citizen sustains a serious injury, then they will invoke their mandate and they will investigate uh, that application of force. Or if there are allegations of sexual assault against an officer, SIU will invoke their mandate and will investigate. We have an Inspector General of Ontario, that's a new position. We also have LECA, that will be a new position when, or a new entity, uh, governing body, uh, which will come in under the new Act, Law Enforcement Complaints Agency. It's actually going to replace OIPRD. We have the Ombudsman, 
I don't need to explain that. Everybody knows who that or what that uh, particular position uh, holds. And then we have the Minister of the Solicitor General, all police services in Ontario report to the uh, Solgen. We have police services boards, we have you, municipal council, and then we also have social media. We like to say you are constantly under the microscope when you are a police officer. Everyone has iPhones and there is CCTV everywhere. Future considerations uh, for policing in our profession in Ontario anyway. The new act, I already talked about that. Um, it's actually the Comprehensive Ontario Police Services Act, but which falls under that act is the Community Safety and Policing Act. Um, other future considerations surround issues in respect to sustainable funding for police services. Also grants versus actual funding for, for our profession. The Inspector General of Ontario, I already talked about that, that's a new position. position. Mental health funding, revised code of conduct under the Act, suspension without pay, and I've already discussed that with Council during my um, budget presentation. WSIB reform, we're still continuing to advocate and lobby with both the provincial government and WSIB reform surrounding certain issues. Decriminalizing illegal substances. I think everybody has uh, heard me numerous times talk about the decriminalization of simple possession and certain illegal substances. Also, the downloading of service responsibilities to police from provincial and federal levels of government and also in the social services as well, surrounding mental health, addictions, homelessness, poverty. A lot of those cases, we end up becoming the default for those complex social issues. And then finally, cultural competence, which we have to take into consideration. And the best way to describe cultural competence is through equity, diversity, and inclusion. And justice as well. And that concludes my presentations. Are there are any questions or concerns? Councillor Bondi. Thank you, Mayor Caniff. Thank you, Chief. Um, <clears throat> just a question. It doesn't really have too much to do with the presentation, but um, considering the, well, I guess it does. Um, considering the added scrutiny on police forces, particularly like south of the border and in Canada as well in the last, say, five years or so, has there been any noticeable effect on morale or recruitment with the police services? Oh, very much so, Councillor. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we're currently going through what I've referred to and you've all heard me talk about a staffing crisis in our profession and attracting people to our profession and also sustaining people in our profession. We've had a lot of people last year in particular in the first time in my 28 years of policing, I had 10 people, well I should say 8 people, 2 of them were terminated but 8 resigned. I don't think ever in the history, that in Chatham-Kent anyway, that we had eight people resign for a multitude of different reasons. Uh, the vast majority just, you know, wanted to go back to what they were originally doing, either as a teacher, uh, nurse, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, and then also the pressures of operational stress injuries. Um, we've had a lot of people. We have currently 22 members. That includes sworn members, officers, but also ECOs, emergency communications operators, dispatchers, which I have three out of those 22 that are off on some form of operational stress injury, primarily PTSD. And dealing with the newer generational cohorts, um, they are far better attuned as to what the profession actually entails. They are not as uh, easily uh, swayed by what I like to refer to as the Hollywood bravado of our profession. Uh, they do appreciate all the difficulties, the challenges associated to our profession, which I just um, relayed to you, Councillor. Um, and then also, you know, all the paperwork, the scrutiny, um, all the challenges associated to our profession, I think. They're just far better attuned to it, the new generational cohorts, than previous generations. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, thank you, and through you, Mayor Caniff. Um, Councillor Story, Crew, and I were here for the 
swearing in of nine recruits about a week or so ago. Um, so you've got a, a great new addition. Uh, it was a very appreciated ceremony. So best of luck with everything, and thank you very much. Thank you for being there, Councillor. Well, thanks, Chief. You passed the clerk's challenge with <laughs> flying colors tonight. So. I hope so. <laughs> She'll give me the devil afterwards. <laughs> thank with, you. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to item 16, tender awards. 16A, tender award contract T23-191, Dufferin Ave Road Rehabilitation. Councillor Hall and Councillor C. McGregor, can I just move this, please? Happy to move, Mayor Kenneth. Happy to second. And Councillor Hall, you had some questions, then followed by Councillor C. McGregor. Thank you, uh, Mayor Kenneth, uh, and thanks to uh, Brendan uh, for the report. I see Mark's coming up to the uh, to the microphone. Um, but yeah, Dufferin Avenue, very key roadway through our community in Wallaceburg. This work is much needed, and I'm happy to see that we're finally able to move forward with it. I just wanted to bring um, attention to a couple points Brendan uh, mentioned in his report, just for, so the community can be aware. Construction is planned to begin next month, June 2023, and be completed by November 2023, with restoration works completed in spring 2024. Two lanes of traffic on Dufferin Avenue and access to all properties and businesses will be maintained at all times throughout the construction. So that was in the report, just wanted to make that very clear to the public, so uh, we often get questions uh, about that. Um, but yeah, getting to uh, um, the questions I wanted to ask, and it's kind of revolving around the Connecting Links funding um, that we received as part of this uh, project. Uh, so as mentioned in the report, Chatham Kent entered two unsuccessful applications for this work, first in 2017-2018. In um, so my question to you, Mark, um, at that time in 2017, what was the anticipated project costs for this at that time? Thank you, Mayor Caniff. Uh The cost estimate in 2017 was $4.9 million. Uh, however, there was additional scope added to this year's project, uh, centered around some storm sewer work and uh, upsizing of some of the water main. So the actual total cost difference between the 2017 estimate and, and the contract award this year would be around $2.5 million. Excellent. Thanks, uh, Mark. And, and at that time as well, uh, back in 2017, what was the maximum amount of Connecting Links funding Chatham Kent could have received for the project at that time? That would have been three million. Okay, so fast forward to now, the tender we're awarding tonight is 8.7 million. Um, and just want to confirm the Connecting Links funding is still maxed out at three million, right? That's correct. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, yeah, that's, uh, when I was reading through this, I we, we deal with these kind of projects and these proposals um, every year at council, and it's just concerning that it's uh, it's just kind of stayed static. I think uh, I think it's really important, really, that the province reevaluate reevaluate the program. Um, as we hear, basically every council meeting, project costs continue to rise year after year, and the funding allotments from the province they're just not keeping pace. So I think this needs to change. The burden continues to fall on the po property taxpayers in Chatham Kent, uh, and this will remain an ongoing issue. So my last question, uh, I'm not sure, if Michael, you want to take this one. Um, but what, what can we do about this as a municipality? Uh, thank you through you, uh, Mayor Tanev. Um, advocate to the province. I mean, we have uh, AMO coming up very soon. Uh, senior staff will be putting together a list of uh, topics that we think you want us to advocate to the province on. We'll probably circulate that to councillors uh, to see if you're comfortable with the with the topics we're, we're going to be asking the province for delegations uh, at AMO 4, and we'll add this one to that to that list. I can't guarantee that the province will uh, accept our request, but I think that's one thing that we can do is continue to advocate to the province. Yeah, thank you uh, for that, uh, Michael. I think uh, I think that's important that we uh, uh, that we make that request and, and, and get in front of the Minister of Transportation um, at AMO and have a delegation on behalf of Chatham Kent. Um, but that, that's all my thank you, Mark and, and, and Michael, for the for the answers, um, and very appreciative of the report, and, and happy that this uh, this work is moving forward in Wall Street. Thank you. Uh, just to add to that, that, several other communities in Ontario would also benefit from this as well. So that's something we would look to uh, get multiple voices coming in to raise that funding. So it's not just Chatham Kent that experiences the uh, shortfall in funding from that. Councillor C. McGregor. Thank you, and through the mayor. 
Um, and thank you, Mark. Uh, I did uh, call in today and had a bit of an explanation, but I will still ask my question publicly and hope for hope for the same answer we discussed this afternoon. So um, in the report, uh, it says there will be a full sidewalk uh, replacement on the north side of Dufferin to the westerly limits of Wallaceburg. And, and it came to my attention, I have brought this uh, in my past term um, on, on behalf of uh, the uh, Fairfield Park nursing home. But the, at the westerly limits, there's two houses um, that are beyond the limits, and then we're at Fair, Fairfield Park. And it's been always been a great concern for, for um, the staff at Fairfield Park for residents that um, when they leave the residence, they actually have to go out onto Dufferin Ave um, and in front of these houses to get to a sidewalk. Often it is um, parents pushing a wheelchair or some members possibly on a mobile device and it's, it's definitely a very unsafe situation. So I was just curious when we were there and I had brought it before, why we wouldn't go these two houses, um, just in front of these two houses, which would bring us to the driveway at Fairfield Park. Thank you, Mary Kenneth. Uh, so this sidewalk was not uh, in the scope of this project, uh, primarily because it, it fell outside of the urban boundary and it's it's within an MTO corridor. Uh, but as we discussed earlier today, uh, we will reach out to the MTO and discuss the requirements to install new infrastructure within their corridor. Uh, and we'll also commit to investigating the feasibility to extend the sidewalk uh, as it relates to potential grading challenges, uh, existing underground infrastructure as well. Thank you, and I did appreciate the call today and, and the explanation. I wasn't considering that it, all of a sudden it became MTO um, area in there, and, and I guess I should have realized that because they just did their revitalization farther out to now. But thank you very much for the, for the explanation, and I look forward to hearing back on, on information that you obtain. Thanks. Seeing no other questions, we'll put it to vote. Councillor Pinsnow. Councillor Pinsano, are you there? Councillor Story, how would you vote? Yes. Thank you. Sorry, Judy. Yes. Thank you. And Councillor Wright. All votes are in. Motion passes 17 to 0. We'll move to item 17, Chief Administrative Office. 17B, Councillor Ward Funding Program Update. Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you very much. I would move that, and I do have some questions. Okay, and uh, Councillor Scotchy. So seconded, Mayor Caniff. Uh Okay, Councillor Thompson, then Councillor Scotchy, then Councillor Seymour Gregor. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a, a couple of questions, because I wasn't, entirely clear and I want to make sure I am super clear on this. I'd like to understand how this could work with organizations like the LTVCA. There are a, a handful of projects that are coming down the pipeline there that I might be interested in helping them out with. Is that something that would be acceptable? Thank you Mr. Mayor through you to Councillor. Uh, for those from listening at home that may be not familiar with that acronym, LTVCA is Lower Thames Valley Conservation Authority. Uh, is my assumption correct that you're talking about the planning of tree projects? Nope, it's not. Uh, there's okay. one I can't talk about at this point. Okay. Another one would be, I could talk about, would be um, for a few years, I've slowly, quietly been working on getting uh, signage on the uh, bridges for canoers coming down the river. And... Um, it's always come back. There's, there's never been any money. Um, one of our former staff members had applied. I think she years ago got like a thousand dollars, which wasn't going to get us anywhere. So that, that's one of them I'm eyeballing, and unfortunately, I, I can't talk about the other one at this point. I can appreciate that. Thanks for the clarification. That does help a bit. Uh, so, based on the current policy, funding is to be used for capital projects, for recreation or culture, art and culture. Mm -hmm. um, for this particular uh, project, you mentioned uh, signage for canoeing. To me, that would be active transportation for recreation. So based on 
that particular project, I would say yes, it would qualify. Okay, and who makes these decisions? How will these decisions get made as far as what does or doesn't qualify? Uh, so for that, I'm going to defer to uh, Chief Administrative Officer Michael Dubin, please. Of course. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Canna. So uh, I think, you know, administration makes a decision. We consult with legal, um, and usually Ms. Wilcox will consult with myself. Um, there, there's no, def, you know, dictionary definition of it. Um, what we can do since uh, the funding is coming from Hydro One is if for some reason there's one that we're not quite sure, uh, we can go to them because they're the ones who actually have criteria um, in the, in the, contribution to us. So all we did was repeat the same criteria. So if we're ever at that point where we're not absolutely sure, we can always reach out to Hydro One. I'd rather not, to be honest with you. I I'm hoping we can make the decisions ourselves. But if there's something that doesn't seem to fit, we can always reach out to them. But, uh, but I agree. I think if it's signage supporting uh, recreation, then it's part of, it's part of recreation. Um, also, if it's signage that is going to have an art component to it, uh, then it's part of the art part. So it, there's no magic to it. We just do the best we can to be reasonable about it. But we can always go to Hydro One if we ever are in a you know in an uncertain situation. Okay, and uh, I'll ask uh, my my second question is, is kind of specific, and it's one, it's it's a different tact, but I've been rolling it over in my head for uh, quite some time ever since this was this was kind of announced, and um, this this money here is. I'll call it one time, although it's not really. It lasts 10 years. Uh, but 10 years can disappear pretty quickly. And, and one thing I had been rolling over was maybe partnering with someone like the Chatham-Kent Community Foundation and trying to set something up that matches the Hydro One criteria. But it's an opportunity to take some of that money and turn it into a perpetual sort of grant system or funding uh, avenue. And I was wondering if that is something that is at all possible underneath uh, our current criteria. Thank you for the question, Councillor. I'm going to defer to our Director of Legal Services, uh, David, um, who is much more versed in the Community Benefit Program with Hydro One. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Uh, David Taylor, Director of Legal Services. I should actually declare for Council that, uh, that I'm a board member of the Chatham Kent Community Foundation, so I feel like I'm actually in a little bit of a spot here to, but because you said it's only a foundation like the Community Foundation, I'll Sure, I'll or you can, uh, as an example, okay, the LTVCA has a, uh, I'll go back to that one, has a foundation as well, and I can see an opportunity there to move that money into that foundation, say, setting it aside specifically for the types of projects that we're discussing tonight. Does that help you in your conflict? Thank you, Councillor. Yes, it does. And uh, I, I think you also used the key words there, which is uh, I can't see really in re reading the documents from Hydro One or the policy that's in front of Council uh, that that would be prohibited. But, of course, each of those has some criteria to it. So, so long as the, the flow through continued on with those same uh, um, criteria, I believe that this would be a workable uh, idea. It's going to be a devils in the details type situation, and certainly administration could work with you in order to kind of work through those details and see if that would be workable. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Councillor Scotchy. Thank you, Mayor Caniff. And uh, I just wanted to firstly take the opportunity to thank uh, yourself as well as the team that um, kind of, uh, you know, brought this together and uh, the advocation. I think it's a great uh, benefit for the community. Uh, a couple of the questions that I, I guess I did have a chance to talk to uh, Ms. Wilcox prior to the meeting, just prior to the meeting, but I do have a couple more. So when it comes to the, um, the, the actual process of filling out the short uh, questionnaire, um, can you just speak to the public a little bit uh, that are listening? What would be the process after you receive this? How would that go? Would there any, be any type of like, um, there wouldn't be no scoring mechanism or something like that. You're just basically going to go look through the submission and say, yep, this is this one fits our description and kind of leave it up to the counselor in question uh, discretion. This came in from your ward. This is what they are. Here's our contact information. Or would you be then sending it to them to tell them to contact um, us? How would that process look? I, I've had a several members kind of uh, in the community ask about that. And I've already actually over the last four months have received multiple asks for funds already. So. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councillor, for the opportunity to provide clarification. Uh, our first step was to try to make this a uh, simple process for the residents, uh, also to uh, use a similar process that has been successful, so leaning on the Together CK Municipal Grant Program. Uh, so we would encourage people to uh, that have 
connected with counselors to go to the Let's Talk Chatham Kent tool where they could answer a few simple questions so that we have an understanding of the nature of their request. Uh, it was then to go to my colleagues of the various areas for them to review it and comment and share it to council. However, uh, just prior to this uh, beginning of the meeting, uh, I don't know if now would be a good time, uh, some of the counselors had suggested they would prefer that instead of it going to my colleagues first, that they would like it to come to them to provide a go, no go decision. Uh, that way um, they could determine if it was a go, it would go to my, my coworkers rather than if it was a no from the beginning to waste time for a lack of a better way of mentioning it. If it was a go, it would go to my colleagues, they would provide comment, that would be shared with the counselors in that ward to determine if they were to fund it. If they were, they would uh, provide that acknowledgement to me and then we would go through the normal grant process where they would uh, complete a grant agreement and we release those funds to them. If someone, uh, and, and if somebody, and correct me if I'm wrong, if somebody did apply for a, a, a grant through one of the other aspects and they weren't successful, they would be almost encouraged to go through this process, correct? That is correct, as long as their request uh, from a Together CK grant uh, was of a capital nature towards recreation and art and culture projects, and also that they would be considered an eligible group, there is some ineligibility associated with this as well. And then the last question I just had it was in regards to the funds um, um, not being committed or publicly uh, announced for the six month period uh, immediately prior to the municipal election. Um, so obviously we know these projects, um, they, you know, sometimes they take time. Um, if something was committed for prior to, um, but was in that period, would we still be going through? Like, because, you know, as you've seen with Mayor Canev's recent announcements and, and that as well, um, you know, he's very much promoting this. Um, would those projects still be promoted the same way, even though it, if the decision was made prior to that, uh, that six month interval? Thank you. Similar to Together CK, when we give approvals, uh, often projects do get delayed, such as construction projects due to the weather. Uh, we would continue with that commitment. Uh, but again, if within the six month window, we, we would not be entertaining that request. And just in closing, I think it's it's great. It's fantastic. I definitely don't want to uh, uh, shine any negative light on receiving additional money for our ward, especially when it comes to recreational amenities and capital amenities like that, because we, we definitely need a lot more in our uh, community. Um, I just think with the process where it does seem simplifies, it's going to be very challenging um, because I, I do feel that we're going to get a lot of requests and um, having no kind of structured way of looking at things, it's basically going to be trying to go through your head of what person or people or groups may deserve money more than the other. And, I, and I, that to me is going to be, maybe just myself, it's going to be really hard to, to say, yes, that's my decision, sorry, next year maybe. Um, I just think that way it's a little bit more difficult. But uh, in some aspects, I guess it's a good problem to have. In other aspects, well, it's, it's going to be difficult. So I do appreciate all the work that yourself and uh, the team has done on this. Thank you. Councillor C. McGregor. Thank you, and through the mayor, and, and I think Amy pretty much uh, addressed this. Um, it, it was my thought that uh, that the councillors should be included at the beginning of the application review and re reimbursement process, simply uh, as opposed to going through the whole process and then getting to the councillors. It might save some steps and some administrative time if, if, uh, if the councillors were involved right at the very beginning before the process began. So thank you. So you know the question, I just want to make a quick comment on this, that I, I love seeing that we're developing a simple process. And, and when you're giving out funds, it's hard to have a really simple process. But the purpose of this is really to use as a catalyst to tap into the passions of businesses, organizations, and individuals in our community. So each council is going to be out there, and, and there's going to be prioritized projects in their wards. There's going to be prioritized projects across the municipality. These funds are to help with, with that, because I, I see literally dozens and dozens and dozens of projects going to be happening over the next year because of these funds and every year. So you're going to have those funds carry forward the next four years, and they're available for the next four years afterwards. Councillor Thompson alluded to it. So eight years, councillors in the mayor's position will have these funds to do those things. So 
I expect to see a lot of really good things happening, but again, it's, it's going to be the businesses, organizations, and individuals that are the drivers of this. The, the funding through the councillors and myself are going to be catalysts towards that. So I'm really excited that this program is going to make a big difference in our community. Thanks. With that, we'll put it to vote. Councillor Pinsno. Yes, Judy. Thank you. Councillor Story. Yes. Thank you. All votes are in. Motion passes 17 to 0. With that, we'll move on all the way down to approval of communication items. Councillor Finn and Councillor Juvenville. Happy to approve that. I so second. Anyone opposed? Motion carries. A non agenda business. Councillor Crew. Thank you, Mayor Caniff. Um, I all of you know that our uh, fellow counselor, uh, Melissa Harrigan, has been um, battling cancer and uh, she's doing well um, with her permission. Um, I'm going to give an update on her campaign, Her Fight is Our Fight. Last weekend, the political boobs, <laughs> Councillor McGrail, Councillor Anderson, Councillor McGregor and myself played in her golf tournament, her ladies tournament. It was a full tournament. Uh, we had a lot of fun. It was rainy. It was wet. It was cold. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, we made just a little less than $5,000 for her campaign. So um, I'm just going to read what she wrote. Uh, her fight is our fight. Oh, I'm going to tell you the number. So uh, her campaign to date, and it isn't done until the end of the month, so there's still time for you to make a donation and top this up. But since she has started this campaign, she has raised $28,150 for mammography in Chatham-Kent. <laughs> so here's her statement. The Her Fight is Our Fight campaign was created to turn a devastating diagnosis into a positive community building initiative that raises funds for our local hospital as well as the importance of preventative screening for women's health initiatives. The current campaign has focused on making mammography suite at Chatham Kent Health Alliance more accessible and less stressful for CK residents. The campaign is still open and donations can be made by visiting CKHA Foundation webpage at cKHAF.ca. So help her get it up over $30,000 and uh, make sure you get your breast screening done. And everyone, um, send a prayer out to Melissa and uh, we will keep her in our prayer and hope for her speedy recovery and back at our table soon. So congratulations and let's get her up over that $30,000. Oops. Councillor Anderson, followed by Councillor Wright. Oh, sorry, Councillor Anderson, followed by Councillor Finn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that it is Nurses Week this week. Um, so from myself to every nurse in Chatham-Kent, Ontario, Canada, and the world, I want to say happy Nurses Week and thank you for all that you do. Um, I just wanted to read something quickly that I didn't write, but I think uh, kind of speaks for us all. Um, we see life and death, miracles and misfortunes. We see love and heartbreak. We relieve suffering, heal, cure unconditionally. We hold hands with strangers and wipe away their tears. We laugh in the face of adversity and cry behind closed doors. We are there from the first breaths of life to the last. We are nurses. Thank you. Councillor Finn. Thank you, Worship. I have a couple things. Um, if you have a child in the community, if you have a child that's graduating grade 8, grade 12, if they're going to a prom, um, you know, tra transportation issues, financial issues, Free Help CK has hundreds of dresses that they are giving away to f for free. Um, you just have to go in, try them on. If you like them, you walk out with it right then and there. We have suits this year for the boys. Um, so. If you're downtown, check them out. They're across from Tees and Sweats in the downtown center. I'd also like to congratulate a couple of uh, girls basketball teams from Chatham. The under-14 girls Wildcats 
uh, went 4-0 to win the Division B Provincial Championship recently, as well as the under-16 girls who went undefeated their entire season to capture their Division Provincial. Congratulations. Councillor Scotchi. Thank you, Mayor Caniff. I just wanted to take the opportunity to uh, congratulate uh, my cousin who was uh, recently drafted in the OHL in the first round. His, uh, both his um, dad was from Blenheim and his mom was from Erio, and uh, he's coming pretty close to local playing for Sarnia. So big congratulations, kind of coming back to uh, this way a little bit anyways. Excellent. Uh, we'll go to the uh, first and second reading. Councillor Pinson and Councillor Wright. Can I get you to move the... First and second reading, please. So seconded. Anyone opposed? Motion carried. Uh, third and final reading, Councillor Allen and Councillor C. McGregor. Would you move that, please? So moved. Happy to second. Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Resolution of Council. And if I can get Councillor B. McGregor to wrap it up for us tonight, that would be great. Thank you. I move that Chatham-Kent Council adjourn to its next meeting to be held Monday, May 15th, 2023, and that Chatham-Kent Council authorize itself to meet and close session that day to discuss any matters permitted by the Municipal Act. I so move. Seconded. We'll wrap this up at 7.08 p.m. Have a great night, everyone. <laughs>